thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we jump in to our presentation, I'd like to turn it over to our Spanish translator to talk to you about the simultaneous um, language option we have today. Thank you, good afternoon. Today's event will be conducted in English with Spanish interpretation available. Anyone who is not Spanish English bilingual will need to please select a language channel. To listen to the uh, to listen to the audio in English on a computer, please locate the globe icon along the bottom row of your Zoom screen and select English. If you're joining via the Zoom app on a mobile device, click more or the three dots in the corner of your screen, select language interpretation, then choose English and then click done. Do not select mute original audio. And I'm going to try to copy these instructions in the chat for your reference. Hola, buenas tardes. El evento de hoy se llevará a cabo principalmente en inglés con interpretación al español. Quien no sea bilingüe en inglés y español tendrá que seleccionar canal de interpretación. Para escuchar el español en su computadora, haga clic en el icono del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom y seleccione su idioma. Si se está conectando a través de la aplicación Zoom en un dispositivo móvil, haga clic en More o Más o en los tres puntos en la esquina de la pantalla. Se Seleccione Language Interpretation, que es la interpretación del idioma. Luego elija su idioma y haga clic en Done. Por favor, no seleccione Mute Original Audio. Y vamos a tratar de poner estas instrucciones en el chat. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we begin today, I'd like to share um, a welcoming message from Director Shondell Dawson of the FIPSA office. Welcome, and thank you very much for joining us today. I am Shondell Dawson, Director of the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act Program, located in Washington, D.C. on the land of the Anacostans. I want to extend a welcome to all who have joined us today because I am so grateful that you have accepted our invitation and will be taking part in this vitally important grants management training series. The FIPSA program has partnered with Director Janice Caldwell and her team in the Office of Grants Management to provide a three-part financial grants management training series to help all FIPSA grantees and sub-grantees learn more about the regulations and best practices for administering federal grants that you receive from the Department of Health and Human Services. These services support hotlines and technical assistance implemented by your agencies are vitally important for survivors and their children living throughout this country and in the US territories. The financial infrastructure and best practices for managing your FITSA grants is a foundational framework that enables you all to do great things on behalf of survivors every day. The FIPSA program and the Office of Grants Management are committed to making sure that you're aware of the requirements and have an opportunity to learn more about the important financial internal controls that each agency should have in place as federal grant recipients. You all are important leaders and advocates for thousands of people, young and old, who experience domestic violence and dating violence and sexual assault. I hope that you find this training series informative and worthwhile, and I thank you for joining us today. Wonderful. Well, hello and welcome to Understanding the Code of Federal Regulations and Cost Principles. As Director Dawson mentioned, this is the first in a series of trainings designed to support FIPSA grantees to effectively manage their federal awards and support survivors to the fullest extent that these funding opportunities allow. My name is Suzanne Marcus, and I am a Contract Grants Management Specialist for FIPSA. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm joining from Silver Spring, Maryland on the Pescataway tribal land. I'll be delivering the training today with my colleague, Laura Kovach, along with the FIPSA program officers and grants management specialists who are here to answer your questions in the Q&A function, and who you can always reach out to for additional information. So let's get started. With the passage of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, the Family Violence Prevention Services Act, FIPSA, has received a historic 
investment of funds that allows FIPSA grantees to expand their scope and reach in new and innovative ways to address the COVID-19 related needs of sexual assault and domestic violence survivors. And along with this comes increased responsibilities for FIPSA grantees, including those who may be managing multiple FIPSA grants for the first time, um, and those who are managing multiple FIPSA funding streams, including their existing core funding, those servicing as pass-through entities, perhaps for the first time, and for many sexual assault programs and culturally specific grantees receiving FIPSA funds for the first time as well. Regardless of the role you play, you are all doing difficult work now more than ever. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the content we're about to cover may feel overwhelming to some. We'll be discussing a lot of regulatory information in the next couple hours. So please remember that this is just the beginning of the conversation. You can always reach out to your FIPSA and OGM staff. They're here to support you as you process this information and apply it to your work. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Laura Kovach, who will provide us with webinar guidance and kick us off with a few polls to help us understand who's here today and um, we can get to know each other a little bit. Hello everyone, my name is Laura Kovach and it's great to be with you today. My pronouns are she and her and I'm joining you from Fairfax, Virginia on the Powhatan tribal lands. Closed captioning will be available during this training to access closed captioning, please click the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then click to show subtitles. Due to the large number of participants, you will be in listen mode only for our webinar today. We will provide other opportunities to engage throughout our time together with different types of activities. We will record the webinar and post to our brand new ARP FIPSA webpage within a few weeks of this event, along with a Spanish version. Any resource or link we provide you in the chat during training today will also be emailed out to everyone. We will use the Q&A function for any questions that you have during this training. The Q&A function is at the bottom of your screen. If there are questions that we don't get to, we will include answers and responses in an FAQ that we will provide following this training. Throughout the training, we will provide knowledge checks and activities and ask you to share your thoughts in the chat. I've already noticed that uh, folks have started to share where they're from, and it's really beautiful to see so many folks in the chat. So feel free to go ahead and uh, share where you're joining us from. Um, you can post that in the chat now, and everyone can see that we have a great turnout um, from across the country, territories, tribes. It's really amazing. We have almost 500 participants today. This is really incredible. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and keep this moving. I'm gonna um, go ahead and launch a poll. We wanna get a sense of um, what your role is. So let's also see not only where you're from, but who's with us today. In this work, often titles don't necessarily reflect the full range of responsibilities. I know we all wear so many different hats, um, but please select what best describes for you. I'm gonna go ahead and launch this Zoom poll. You can see we have financial officer, state administrator, grant manager, executive director, sexual assault advocate, folks from our tribal communities. All right, folks are still answering. All right, slowing down a little bit here. I'll give everybody a few more seconds. People are typing in the chat and answering the poll at the same time. We are great multitaskers. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. I'm gonna share the results. 
So it looks like we've got a lot of financial staff with us today, um, state administrators, grant managers, program directors, culturally specific programs, sexual assault advocates, tribal program specialists. Wonderful, welcome everyone. Okay. We have one last question that we want to ask. So this is where we're going to have you share in the chat. While it's exciting to have this new funding, we know this funding can also come with lots of challenges, particularly around the financial aspect of managing these funds. Our goal is to partner with you to help address these challenges through responsive training and technical assistance. Please share your concerns and or challenges in the chat with administering FIPSA funds so that we can ensure our trainings and materials are addressing your needs. We will take notes from the chat and utilize this for future trainings. So in the chat, go ahead and answer this question for us. What are your concerns and or anticipated challenges around administering the FIPSA American Rescue Plan Supplemental Funds? Capacity, seeing that right away. Subrecipient monitoring, reporting. state and federal systems not necessarily on the same page, reporting, 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 compliance, allowable costs, cost allocations, capacity again. So a lot of themes we're seeing here. Thank you so much for sharing. We're gonna definitely be um, uh, taking note of all of these. We hope to answer some of these questions today, but we'll make sure that we're keeping these things in mind as we move forward around future training and technical assistance. The goal of this training is to provide foundational information and resources necessary to effectively manage your FIPSA grant and to understand how to use the Code of Federal Regulations as a policy resource that you can consult when you have questions. After completing this training module, you will be able to explain the Code of Federal Regulations or CFR, cost principles, and how to use the CFR as a resource to determine if costs are eligible, allowable, reasonable, and allocable under your FIPSA grant. Determine the difference between indirect and direct costs. Explain what an indirect cost rate is and the three options grantees have for indirect cost reimbursement, identify how costs should be allocated, locate and interpret CFR sections that help clarify common questions about FIPSA grant allowable costs. Find resources to assist with implementing and effectively managing your FIPSA grant. So our agenda for today, this is our first module um, that we're offering. We will begin by providing an overview of the 45 CFR Part 75. Next, we'll discuss the cost principles used to make financial management decisions based on the interrelated principles of allowability, reasonableness, and allocability. We'll talk about what an indirect cost rate is and how organizations go about reimbursing for their indirect costs. We'll then address common questions about allowable costs for FIPSA grants including construction costs, purchasing vehicles, and gift cards, and how and when to request prior approval. Lastly, we'll share resources and other tools FIPSA grantees can refer to when questions about your grant come up. So lots of acronyms um, that we will be using in today's training or that some of you might be already familiar with. So here's the list of acronyms that relate to aspects of administering your FIPSA grant. The use of acronyms, particularly for those new to federal grants, can be a little overwhelming. If you are new to working with rape crisis centers, sexual assault programs, please look at the lower right-hand corner for common acronyms that are used around the SANE program and the SART program. In this training, we will spell out all acronyms, and this list is to help you decode the alphabet soup. So there's a few key definitions that we wanted to um, provide for you all. So here are some terms that are often used in the rules and regulations and that we'll also discuss today. 
I'm going to go ahead and drop the full definitions in the chat once Suzanne gets going with it with the next section. But really quickly, the pass through entity um, in the upper left hand corner means a non federal entity that provides a sub award to a sub recipient to carry out part of a federal award. A sub award means an award provided by a pass through entity to a sub recipient to carry out part of a federal award. A federal award is a federal financial assistance that is non federal entity receives directly from a federal awarding agency or indirectly from a pass through entity and then a non federal award. An entity, a non-federal entity means a state, local, government, Indian tribe, institution of higher education or nonprofit that carries out a federal award as a recipient or a subrecipient. Now, um, I'll get those definitions in the chat, but I'm going to hand it back over to Suzanne to dig into the CFR portion of our training. Thank you, Laura, for getting us started and providing us with some helpful foundational information. We'll begin with the Code of Federal Regulations, which is where all the rules of executive departments and agencies of the federal government can be found. The CFR is divided into 50 titles that represent broad areas subject to federal regulations. Title 45, Part 75 of the CFR covers the administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which is where FIPSA is housed. So basically, the 45 CFR, Part 75, is HHS's version of the 2 CFR 200 and sets forth how HHS implements their rules and requirements for grant awards. The 2 CFR 200 might sound familiar to many of you. These regulations apply to the implementation and administration of federal awards across government agencies and establishes uniform administrative guidance around um, cost principles and audit requirements for federal awards and non-federal entities such as nonprofit organizations and state and local government. The 2 CFR Part 200 is often referred to as uniform grant guidance or uniform guidance. But one important thing that you should know about the 2 CFR 200, it does not apply to HHS's administration for children and families, which includes FIPSA grantees, but it likely applies to your other federal grants, even some of your HHS grants that you may receive outside of ACF. This is because ACF has not adopted the 2 CFR 200. But the good news is that the regulatory code in 45 CFR Part 75 is parallel to the 2 CFR 200 in almost all cases. But for your FIPSA grants, you should always refer to the 45 CFR Part 75 when you're seeking regulatory information. The CFR is organized first by title, then by chapter, subchapter, part, and subpart. So given that, this 45 CFR part 75 name refers to first 45. That's short for title 45, which is the section of the CFR that applies to the public welfare code. CFR is short for code of federal regulations, which as we mentioned is a coded numbers and letters set of laws published by the federal government of the United States. Part 75 is a uniform administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements for HHS. Under 45 CFR Part 75 are subparts. Subpart A provides acronyms and definitions Subparts B through D sets forth the administrative requirements for non-federal entities to manage their federal awards. Subpart E establishes principles for determining the allowable costs incurred by non-federal entities under federal awards. And subpart F sets forth standards for obtaining consistency and uniformity among federal agencies for the audit of non-federal entities. So now let's take a closer look at how you can look up a specific CFR citation. First, go to www.ecfr.gov. And we will drop a link in the chat so you can um, 
see where that website is located. In the search bar, you can type in a term such as audit requirements and then select the title you're looking for, in which case, if it's pertaining to your FIFSA grant, you would select Title 45. You can also search by code. So you can put in a specific code such as um, 75.404 or 404, which is for reasonable costs, and then look under Title 45. Now that you know how to read and look up CFR citations, we're going to move on and discuss the 45 CFR 75 part, subpart E, which focuses on cost principles. And always remember as we go through this training and make cite, and refer to citations that you can always go back to this website and look up specific citations if you need more details around what we discuss. So now I'm going to turn to cost principles. The cost principles set forth in 45 CFR 75 subpart E are to be used to make financial management decisions based on the interrelated principles of allowability, reasonableness, and allocability. Allowability refers to whether or not a cost is allowable under the federal grant. Reasonable costs refer to whether or not a cost is generally recognized as ordinary and necessary to the implementation of the grant. And a cost is allocable if the goods and services involved are chargeable or assignable to that federal grant. Even if costs are reasonable, allowable, and allocable in regards to the 45 CFR cost principles, they must also be eligible under the specific grant funding regulations in order for costs to be reimbursed. So for example, let's say a survivor needs rental assistance paid for a sublet from a friend or family member or a community member who will only accept direct cash payment. While rental payments are an allowable cost under the FIPSA ARP grants, and the amount requested might be reasonable and even allocable under the FIPSA ARP grant as well. It is not eligible because FIPSA funds cannot be given directly to the client or survivor. And the transaction must be properly documented and recorded, which cash, cash payments does not allow for. It would be allowable, however, if the grantee makes rental payments on behalf of the survivor to the third party, and the payment can be properly recorded and documented. Similarly, even if a cost is eligible under a specific program, like staff travel or lodging, for example, they must be reasonable according to cost principles. A first-class airline ticket or a stay in a penthouse hotel room are generally not reasonable and would not be reimbursed under your federal grant. This section will cover these cost principles in more detail, and we'll address some of the common questions around cost principles that often come up for FIPSA grantees. Let's take a look at allowable costs. When determining if a cost is allowable under, federal, under your federal award, the following general criteria must be met. It's necessary and reasonable for the performance of the federal award, any limits or exclusions in the 45 CFR or grant award related to activities and or costs is followed. It's consistent with grantee organizational policies and procedures. I'm gonna make a quick side note here to say that we'll talk more about this, but it's very important to review your policies and procedures to ensure that they support new allowable costs that you may be approving through the FIPSA ARP awards. And um, you should also consider the factor of determination of, or of cost is allowable if it um, is consistent with um, and in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, also known as GAAP, and that the costs are not used to meet matching cost sharing requirements of another federal award unless authorized by statute. And lastly, that the costs are adequately documented and not included in the cost of any other federal program. 
here's just a select list of the allowable costs in one or both of the FIPSA ARP grants to support survivors of sexual assault and the COVID-19 testing vaccines and mobile health units access supplemental funding. Look closely at the program guidance memos for the full scope of allowable costs. Current organizational policies may not align with the full range of allowable costs covered in these FIPSA ARP grants. For example, funds can be used to pay for survivors' rent and motel stays, or for providing staff bonuses. Pass-through entities and subrecipients may need to modify or create new policy that aligns with these new allowable costs if they want to use FIPSA ARP funds in these expanded ways. Grantees must maintain adequate documentation to support all costs charged to their FIPSA awards. Particularly if you receive multiple FIPSA grants, it is important that you have internal controls for appropriately documenting and recording your expenses to ensure you are charging the right grant. The following suggestions should be included in your organization's internal controls. At a minimum, grantees should have a list of allowable and unallowable costs that personnel have pre-approved. So for example, the executive director and fiscal staff should um, have a list of allowable expenses and unallowable costs that they can always refer to. There should be adequate separation of duties in review of authorization of costs. So for example, the person who reviews the expenditures, typically the fiscal staff, should be different from the person making payments, typically the program staff. For smaller organizations with five or less staff, the executive director and staff person can both be tasked with making deposits, opening mail and documenting expenses. The board of director can share in these duties as well. And there should be staff training on allowable and unallowable costs under the FIPSA grant programs. This training should be conducted regularly to account for staff turnover. Now let's take a look at how to determine reasonable costs. When you're determining if a cost is reasonable, consider the following, whether the cost is necessary to the functioning of the project, if sound business practices are used. So what does that mean exactly? Some examples of sound business practices include the cost of a good or service is based on a scope of work and adheres to a code of conduct to avoid violating public bid laws. Business agreements are supported by written documentation and cash disbursements are fully authorized and documented. A cost is reasonable when all parties involved have equal bargaining power and the same information leading the parties to agree upon fair market terms, and this is called arm's length bargaining. And federal, state, local, tribal, and other laws and regulations are, are, are um, you're adhering to those laws, and the terms and conditions of the federal award all must be considered when determining reasonable costs. So an easy way to think about this is to use what is called the prudent person test, which is to say the cost must be reasonable on the basis that they're ordinary and necessary for the performance of the activity, consistent with market prices, based on prudent action by those incurring the cost and consistent with the organization's policies and practice. For some grantees, it might be hard to obtain market prices for comparable goods if you live in a region that doesn't have those options or if internet research is challenged due to Wi-Fi access. If your ability to determine reasonable costs is compromised by these kinds of barriers, please reach out to your FIPSA project officer or your OGM representative for support on how to navigate these challenges. Okay, I know this is a lot of information to process. I'm gonna pass it over to Laura now, who will take us through some knowledge check activities. All right, thanks, Suzanne. Um, that was a lot of information. And so we're going to take a beat, take a pause, um, try and absorb all of that information. We're definitely encouraging you to use the Q&A function if you have questions. 
Um, but let's uh, use the chat for our first activity. So let's say you've determined the reasonable cost, having considered all the factor factors Suzanne just listed. How should you document your analysis for the purpose of audits or sharing your reasoning if you're questioned by your state administrator or your FIPSA program officer? You can share some examples in the chat and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna read this one more time. Having considered all of these factors that Suzanne has shared, you determine a cost is reasonable. How should you document your analysis and decision in case you need to justify your decision or for the purposes of an audit? Go ahead and feel free to put some ideas into the chat. How are you going to document your reasonable costs? It is allowable, yes. So you've determined that a cost is allowable. How are you, following your procurement policy is great. Follow, following policies and procedures is really important in terms of documentation. Keeping receipts, logging spreadsheets. Write it down and save it. Receipts, receipts, receipts. I'm seeing lots of that. Using backup documents. Clear description of the cost. Document, document, document. Great, lots of really great ideas. Always having a paper trail. So some other examples, um, many of you have already um, shared some of these in the chat. So detailed receipts, invoices for comparable services. So if you're trying to determine if something is reasonable and you've purchased something and you need you know, more than one um, estimate. So making sure you have all of those things documented um, that you looked at um, in uh, estimates for different services. This is great. Thank you so much for sharing. Prices, quotes, selections, all of those things, yes. So let's practice determining reasonable costs. On your slide, you're gonna see um, two organizations are purchasing laptops. So Safety for Families um, has requested two laptops at $2,200 per laptop. And Sacred Circle Resource Center has requested eight laptops at $1,000 per laptop. So we have a couple of different um, options here. Do you think either of these agencies have unreasonable costs? And would you deny either of them? So you can see we've got two options. We've got two organizations who are purchasing. And we have, do you think either of these agencies have unreasonable requests? Would you deny either of them? We've got some no's, some maybes, would not deny. There's not enough information, okay. No's, the, um, Need more details. Depends on the laptop specifics. Oh, making sure you have your quotes reasonable. Um, would make sure that you that um, the grantee uh, was submitting their quotes or the subgrantee was submitting their quotes and that approval from vendor. Okay, great. Um, thank you for sharing in the chat. So some things to consider as we're thinking about these two different, these two requests. Some quite, and some of you are already um, asking these questions um, in the chat, which is great. Uh, we always wanna have as much information as possible. So is SFF, located in an area of the state or territory where the product is more expensive? Does, S, does SFF's laptop have more capabilities to conduct a different kind of acti activity than that of SCRC's laptop? What is included in the purchase? Some of you were asking that question in the chat. Hotspot, case, increased memory, docking station, extra security, dependent upon what the position is um, to make sure that records are kept safe. Is SCRC's laptop cost reduced because of price break on quantity? They're buying eight, do they get um, a cheaper price? Did the subgrantee obtain information or bids from different businesses in the area before purchasing? 
and what does their purchasing policy say? So all of you were asking these questions um, in the chat, which was fantastic. These, so these are just some good things to consider. And then some tips for determining reasonable costs include, if you're the pass-through entity and you have questions about the reasonableness for a subrecipient's cost, you should ask for more information, including the organization's purchase policy, and do your own research about the costs in that particular community. If you're a subrecipient, document your analysis. Sorry, if you're a subrecipient, document your analysis for determining reasonable cost. Have a policy and internal controls for purchasing goods and services. And when in doubt, reach out um, to your FIPSA program officer. Cost should be determined prior to purchase, during the application or budget approval process. Expenses shouldn't really increase significantly from the approved budget, even though budget costs are estimates. Remember, if determined to be unreasonable, then reimbursement could be denied. Um, now I'm going to turn it back over to Suzanne, who will talk about the last cost principle, which is allocable costs. Thank you, Laura. So let's talk about allocable costs. <clears throat> a cost is allocable if the goods or services involved are chargeable or assignable to the federal award. So how is an allocable cost different from an allowable cost, you might be wondering. A cost is allowable only if the cost is reasonable it and it reflects what a prudent person might pay. The cost is allocable if it, the cost is allocable if the grant that paid the expense benefits from it. So in other words, a cost is allocable if it meets these standards, is incurred specifically for the federal award, benefits both the federal award and other, and, and other work of the non-federal entity and can be distributed in proportions that may be approximated using reasonable methods and is necessary to the overall operation of the grantee and is assignable in part to the federal award in accordance with the cost principles in subpart 75405. Okay, so what does that all mean exactly? So let's break it down. A cost that is incurred specifically for one program is called a direct cost. An example might be a salary of a program manager. A cost that benefits more than one program is called a proportionally allocated cost. So a salary for an administrative assistant who works for two programs is a good example because the salary can be allocated between, or can be allocated based on the number of hours worked for each program. And a cost that typically benefits all programs is in, a, in an agency equally and are therefore difficult to allocate to a particular program is called an indirect cost. Payroll or accounting services that cannot be easily charged to a specific program is a good example of an indirect cost. Now I'm going to pass it over to Laura who will walk us through a quick knowledge check determining indirect and direct costs, followed by a case study exercise. All right. Thanks, Suzanne. Okay, Any, an easy way to determine direct and indirect costs is to think about it in these terms. Direct costs are costs linked to a program objective. Basically, these costs are directly for the project. If the project went away, the costs would go away. Direct costs should be attributed and traceable. Indirect costs, on the other hand, are difficult to be traced to a specific project. If the project went away, but the cost stays, then it is an indirect cost. So we're gonna do a quick activity with some of the examples that you see on your screen now. As I read through each line, and we have five options on the screen, please type into the chat box whether you think the item is a direct or indirect cost. I'm gonna read that one more time. As I go through each line, through each example, one through five, please type in the chat box whether you think the item is a direct or an indirect cost. So let's go ahead and start with number one. Rent and utilities for offices in multiple locations. 
So I'm seeing lots of indirect, indirect, indirect. <laughs> um, yes, uh, this is a little tricky. The answer, yes, is indirect if the office space houses multiple tr programs. However, if 100% of FIPSA ARP funded staff is the only staff personnel located in the outreach office, for example, then a grantee could charge the rent and utilities to um, the ARP grant as direct costs. So it could potentially be both. <laughs> um, question number two, subcontract for therapy services to victims. Is that direct or indirect? Direct, seeing lots of, I like the shortcut using the letter D, very efficient, direct. The answer is direct cost as the cost directly serves survivors. Great job. All right, number three, travel for the program funded advocate meeting a survivor at the hospital. Seeing lots of Ds and directs, yes. <laughs> um, this is a direct cost as well because the travel is to provide services that would not exist if the grant did not exist. Okay, number four is another travel question for administrative staff to pick up mail and make a bank deposit. I'm seeing I's and indirects, lots of I's and indirects, yes. This is an indirect cost because the administrative staff is traveling for reasons that are non-specific to any one grant. For example, traveling to pick up mail or make a deposit to the bank for, to the, bank for the agency. Okay, last one, client assistance in the form of a rental voucher. Direct, 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 lots of Ds, direct. This is um, a direct cost because the rental voucher directly assists the survivor. Remember, it must be an allowable cost and not directly paid to the victim. For example, paying rent on behalf of the victim directly to the landlord. Nonprofit organizations are, everyone did an excellent job. Thank you very much uh, for participating. Nonprofit organizations are diverse in their characteristics and accounting practices which means that direct and indir indirect costs could vary by organization. This activity is designed to assist you in thinking about how to break out indirect and direct costs, but this may vary depending on your unique situation. If you're a pass-through entity, it may be helpful to ask the subrecipients to break out their indirect and direct costs for you to review and verify if the grantee has an indirect cost rate or using the de minimis rate, which we'll be discussing momentarily. So uh, we want to talk a little bit about administrative costs. State and tribal agencies who are direct recipients of the FIPSA funds can utilize a portion of their overall amount of the award on administrative costs to administer the FIPSA ARP grants. In this slide, you will see a summary of the administrative costs generally included for administrating FIPSA grants. This bulleted list provides just a few examples for some of the cost items associated with administering FIPSA funds. Please note this is not an exhaustive list, but provides some examples as a reference. Please remember that the administrative costs should be specific to the grant funds. For example, an organization can't request reimbursement for time spent on another non-FIPSA project. So you can see the list from accounting services, planning and developing and designing the program, monitoring program activities for compliance. So just a, a short list to get started. If you have questions, um, please go ahead and put that um, in the Q&A function. I'm, I'm seeing some questions in the chat. We've got Office of Grants Management specialists who've joined us for today um, and can answer your questions in the Q&A function. Okay. We're gonna jump into a case study. So now that we've discussed cost principles, let's examine a scenario that may look a lot like a situation you have faced in your work. So for example, you're a dual domestic violence and sexual assault program, and you have decided to spend some of your FIPSA ARP sexual assault funds on a new vehicle for mobile advocacy. Your goal is to meet with sexual assault survivors for follow-up care and provide advocacy as needed. One of the domestic violence survivors you are working with needs transportation to a court appointment. This client is currently receiving domestic violence advocacy support from your agency 
and does not has not identified as a sexual assault survivor and is not receiving sexual assault services. So I want to start first with um, question number one, and please answer in the chat. For our state administrators out there, what advice would you provide to your grantee to manage multiple funding streams? If you're working with this dual agency, what advice would you provide to your grantee to manage multiple funding streams if you are a state administrator? You can add your thoughts into the chat. Separate chart of accounts, have separate funds for each grant. Use the cost allocation sheet for each grant. Great. Activity logs, good ideas. At the time of purchase, the subrecipient can proportionally allocate the cost of the van based on how often it will be used for the domestic violence and sexual assault programs or any other benefiting programs. It can be done later if you notice additional needs can be met through the use of the van, but just remember to proportionally allocate the funds across the various grants that you're using. So using FIPSA um, tracking mileage and track tracking log, using a log to, to track who's using it and when. Very good, great. Okay, if you're a program subrecipient, how should you document the use of the vehicle under the ARP sexual assault funding? You can go ahead and share your thoughts in the chat. We've heard some of these examples so far. If you're a program recipient, I'm saying D, um, D again for direct cost. I love it. Um, this is a direct cost, yes. The, the grantee needs to track when the van is used for which purpose to ensure the costs are proportionally allocated to the right grant stream. Often grantees have a log that tracks when the van is used, for what purpose and program, and also tracking the mileage. We have some other advice in here about also um, making sure you're following policies and procedures that are already set up. Uh, pro rate sheet for agency fuel. Great, these are all really great suggestions. Okay, and finally, if the grantee isn't sure what to do, who, um, who can they speak with about the usage of funds when managing multiple funding streams, grant officer? the financial manager at the organization, program managers, so your in-house staff, the funder, executive director of the state administrating, administrating agency, your state administrator. So, You've, you've got all the bases covered, perhaps your state administrator or the pass-through entity who is uh, responsible for the funds, your FIPSA pro, um, program officer or the grants management officer. So reaching out um, to, your, uh, to your support network, either within the organization or state and federal support for technical assistance. Thank you so much for participating in this exercise, everyone did excellent. Now I'm passing it back to Suzanne to discuss options for reimbursing indirect costs. And remember to keep using the Q&A function. Hi, thank you so much, Laura. I'm happy you mentioned the Q&A function because we're about to dive into um, some pretty dense material about indirect costs. I think you'll, um, many of you will have follow-up questions. I encourage you to use the Q&A and just to remind you that if we're not able to answer your question, we will be providing an FAQ following this training for any questions we weren't able to answer. So we discussed in the previous section that indirect costs are those that support the overall functioning of the agency and benefit more than one program. So in this section, we'll take a high level look at the options organizations have for getting federal reimbursement on their indirect costs. There are three options for getting um, your indirect costs reimbursed. Option one is called a negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. 
Option two is the 10% de minimis rate. And option three is a direct allocation method. So let's start with federally negotiated indirect cost rates or ICR. In general terms, an indirect cost rate is the percentage of an organization's indirect costs to some subset of its direct costs and is, standard, and is a standardized method of charging individual programs for their share of indirect costs. Indirect cost rates are negotiated with an organization's cognizant federal agency, which is the federal agency that provides the most federal funds to an organization, or for tribal grantees, the Bureau of Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. This is their cognizant agency. Negotiating an indirect rate is time intensive and requires accounting expertise. But the benefit is that once approved, the rate can and indeed must be used across all of an organization's federal awards as a means to recuperate indirect costs. Investing in negotiating an approved rate makes sense for large, more complex organizations that may not, but may not be worth the investment for smaller organizations with less complicated funding structures. One more note about ICRs in practice. When an organization, such as a subrecipient, is using an indirect cost rate to charge indirect costs, they are not applying that rate, often it's 20% or higher, to all of their direct costs. Rather, negotiated rates are always based on and then applied to some subset of direct costs. Typically, salaries and wages or salaries and wages plus benefits is used as the direct cost base. For an organization using a negotiated cost rate that had salaries, wages, and fringe benefits as the direct cost base, when invoicing the pass-through entity, the rate would be applied only to the invoiced value of the applicable direct cost base and not to all direct costs. This will come up with the de minimis method for recovering indirect costs as well. If you are interested in pursuing a negotiated indirect cost rate and HHS is your cognizant federal agency, you will need to reach out to the Payment Support Center or PSC, which offers a full range of review and negotiation services for indirect cost rates and cost allocation plans associated with federal grants and contracts. And here you'll find their information. The second option is to use a 10% de minimis rate, which is an indirect cost instrument implemented under the revised 2 CFR 200 and in the 45 CFR part 75. So what does this mean? By offering an organization the opportunity to use a 10% indirect cost rate to recover some of their indirect costs on federal awards, they don't have to go through the rigorous and time-consuming process of negotiating an indirect cost rate with a federal cognizant agency. Think of it as a shortcut negotiated rate preset at 10%. This is particularly helpful for smaller organizations and those subrecipients who do not have the financial resources to engage the necessary accounting and finance personnel to assist them with preparing an indirect cost rate proposal for negotiations. They also often do not have the resources to maintain their financial management system to track costs consistent with their proposed indirect cost rate structure once in place. So as with the negotiated cost rate, if an organization uses a de minimis rate on a FIPSA award, it must be used across the organization for all federal awards. Using this method requires no approval from a federal agency or an HHS pass-through entity, and the method can be used indefinitely. 
As with the negotiated rate, the de minimis rate is not applied to all of a program's direct costs, but rather a very specific subset of those costs. In this case, the subset is called the modified total direct cost pool, often referred to as MTDC. The MTDC pool does include cost items such as staff salaries, employee travel, and program supplies, but it does not include items such as participant vouchers or direct assistance to clients, such as children's supplies, clothing, and transportation vouchers. Those last costs are eligible FIPSA costs. They just aren't included in the direct cost base to which the 10% rate is applied. Thus, when recovering indirect costs using the de minimis rate, care should be taken to make sure the rate is being applied to eligible direct costs only. The third option we're looking at is the use of the direct allocation method, which is one of three cost allocation methods used, the two others being a simplified allocation method and the multiple rate allocation method. We're focusing on the direct allocation method because it's most commonly used method and the simplest of all the methods. Using the direct allocation method, all costs are charged directly to programs except for general administration. Direct allocation treats all costs except admin and other general expenses as direct costs. Shared, that is, indirect costs, treated as direct costs by pro are treated as direct costs by prorating them on a uh, excuse them on based on a rational basis so for example the fipsa program employs 5 people and uses 10% of the office space in a 50 person organization so 10% of the facilities overhead for the office space is directly allocated to the fipsa award but the program may use 25% of the organization's cell phone lines or 25% of the shared costs that would be charged to the FIPSA award. This is the preferred method used by most nonprofits, especially smaller ones. So I know this was a lot of information in three slides. I just want to remind folks again, this won't be the last time that you will have access to this information and an opportunity to ask questions. Not only can you use the Q&A, but we're also using the opportunity in regional meetings to dive into different sections of this training that you'd like to learn more about or hear more specific details on. So moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about the common questions around allowable costs and requesting prior approval. First and foremost, there are unallowable costs that all FIPSA grantees should be aware of. Direct payments to, survi to survivors is unallowable, meaning that under the FIPSA Services Act, or the, excuse me, under FIPSA, direct cash assistance and direct payments are unallowable with FIPSA funding, and that is direct cash assistance to survivors. Construction and renovation costs are also unallowable. Capital expenditures for improvements on building, land, and equipment are unallowable as direct charges, except with the prior approval of the HHS awarding agency or pass-through entity. And we'll talk a little bit more about prior approval in a few minutes. Recipients of federal funds are not allowed to use federal funding to lobby federal, state, tribal, or local officials. And this link um, provides you with more details, which we will drop in the chat, specifically around lobbying restrictions. Costs that are determined unallowable must be refunded, including interest to the federal government in accordance with um, HHS. So let's talk a little bit about client assistance, because while you're not allowed to provide 
direct cash assistance, there are a lot of opportunities for supporting survivors, particularly with the FIPSA art funds in many and other ways. FIPSA does allow for purchase of gas, food, and gift cards when it's given to the client to address their needs directly related to their victimization. The need for service in the form of gas, food, or gift cards may include, but are not limited to, addressing the temporary homelessness through the provision of motel stays or other ways to support a survivor to access safe housing or safe shelter or helping to address the impact of financial abuse, whereby the survivor needs help seeking employment or employment services. Gas, food, and gift cards can also help support survivors in getting to appointments, such as social services or child welfare appointments, court proceedings, medical or therapeutic needs, and getting the children to and from school or childcare and so on. Organizations should have an established policy and protocol on how these gas, food, or gift cards are purchased, including related amounts, and how the cards will be distributed to program participants, including outlining, outlining how this resource could be offered equally to any in need of the service. Organizations that provide gas or gift cards should keep a record of the number of cards and amounts, reason for issuance, and which recipients receive them without breaking confidentiality. So now I'm going to pass it over to Laura for a quick knowledge check related to when it's appropriate to approve the use of a gas, food, or gift card for a survivor you're serving. All right. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I just wanted to note um, in the chat, we have um, provided an additional resource, um, Office of Grants Management sent us um, for cost allocation services. So if you look in the chat for the Program Support Center, please use that website that I just posted for cost allocation services. Okay, let's jump into um, client assistance. So again, we're gonna ask you to provide your answers in the chat um, and please feel free to share why um, you provided the answer um, that you did. The Domestic Violence Housing Program provides a family with food and gift cards to nearby stores to help them settle into their temporary safe housing. Is this allowable or unallowable? Seeing allowable and unallowable. As, yes, as long as the program has policies in place. Okay, so I'm seeing an overwhelming majority saying allowable in the chat. All right, this is an allowable cost because the need, the need for services is directly related to the family's homelessness, which is related to their victimization. So this first one around the food gift cards um, is allowable. Okay, our second one. A DV advocate provides a survivor with a gas card so she can take her children to a pediatric counseling center across town to receive services. Is this allowable or unallowable? The overwhelming majority are saying A or allowable. You are correct. This is allowable. So the provision of a gas card uh, addresses the family's need to access counseling services, which is a need connected to their victimization. All right, we've got one more. Okay, so allowable or unallowable. A tribal sexual assault advocate provides gift cards for survivors in a support group to purchase supplies so the group can weave with cedar bark. Unallowable or allowable? I'm seeing a mix of both, unallowable and allowable. I saw allowable as part of healing services, allowable if it addresses victimization, allowable if the weaving is therapy. Okay, seeing some folks aren't sure, totally fine. This is an allowable cost because weaving with cedar bark can be part of a traditional healing practice for certain tribes. 
Thanks everyone for your input. All of these situations are allowable, but if you have questions, never hesitate to reach out to your FIPSA program, uh, project officer for guidance. Now I'm gonna pass it back over to Suzanne, who will continue to talk about frequently asked allowable cost questions. Thanks, Laura. Um, now let's talk about motor vehicles, which is another cost that raises questions for FIPSA grantees, particularly with these new ARP um, supplemental funding opportunities with the focus on mobile advocacy. Motor vehicles are defined as general purpose equipment. Capital expenditures for vehicles and other general purpose equipment are unallowable as direct costs except with the prior written approval of the HHS awarding agency or pass-through entity. So if FIPSA or the pass-through entity approves the vehicle purchase as a direct charge, ACF's tangible personal property guidance provides the reporting and purchasing requirements related to large equipment purchases like vehicles, which can be found on their website and we will drop that link in the chat. This guidance states that capital expenditures, such as a motor vehicle, will be charged in the period in which the expenditure is incurred or as otherwise determined appropriate and negotiated with ACF. Given that a focus on the ARP grants, um, the ARP grant awards as mobile advocacies, programs may wanna purchase vehicles to help program advocates meet with survivors in their communities, which as I mentioned, requires prior approval. So how does one do this? Let's take a look. So broadly speaking, to request prior approval, the following must be provided. Written requests signed by the authorized official on letterhead attached to an email to your FIPSA program officer. Within the email and written letter, the grantee must provide the grant number and grant program name that they choose to utilize funding for the said item and or equipment purchase. Within the written request, the grantee must provide three unit price quotes per unit and is, uh, that is being purchased and provide the purpose of the request within their written response. You should also include the federal fiscal years and programs that you're um, relating this um, purchase to and grant document numbers and other benefiting programs and allocation of costs. Once the FIPSA program manager receives a written request from the grantee, the program manager will review the request and make some and make sure it aligns with the grantee program narrative and allowable costs under the specific grant award. They'll refer to the 45 CFR and FIPSA regulations. If the grantee provided all the required documentation within the written request, the FIPSA program officer will then approve the request programmatically and then forward it to the assigned OGM grant officer for that region to determine final financial approval. If the program manager has questions or concerns as to the purpose of the request or needs more reasoning um, for, or price quotes, the program manager will return the request to the grantee to make the necessary changes before the programmatic approval is, or before, before there is programmatic approval or denial of the request. So let's look at this specifically as it pertains to motor vehicles since um, many of you might be um, looking at doing that. So let's just look at what a prior approval specifically for a motor vehicle would entail. You should include the following, um, the, grant number of the, um, the grant number of the budget that is being used for the purchase, three quotes of leases or purchases for the vehicle, Include the vehicle identification number or VIN number of the vehicle, the make, model, and year of the vehicle. Um, be sure to specify the need and purpose of the vehicle as it relates to your FIPSA funding grant. And amendments to the budget, including insurance and other considerations such as maintenance and gas. I wanna just quickly draw your attention 
to a list, uh, a, a very comprehensive list of prior approvals required specifically for discretionary grantees. You can find it at the link below. Like I said, this is for discretionary grantees, but many of these apply to other FIPSA grantees as well. You just need to consult your 45 CFR to confirm that um, these other um, instances in which um, prior approval is required pertain to you. Some of these cases include when you want to change the organizations administ um, administering the grant, or you wanna change the status of key personnel named in your notice of award, or when you wanna make a post award change to the scope of your project. Construction, land, or building acquisition, as we discussed earlier, is a case where you must obtain prior approval as well. Indemnification of third parties is a case where you must seek prior approval. This means using FIPSA funds as compensation for harm or loss. In these cases, you need prior approval. You must obtain prior approval for any no cost extensions up to 12 months. This means requesting additional time to complete grant related activities after the term of your grant end. And if you spend against your award before the effective date of the initial budget period of a new or competing continuation award, you must seek prior approval. So again, these are specifically for discretionary grantees. However, some may apply to others. And um, you can, we will drop that link in the chat. Um, and again, please feel free to ask questions um, in the Q&A function. So moving on to fringe benefits. This is another allowable cost that are particularly pertinent to the FIPSA ARP grants that include bonuses and hazard pay, among other allowable costs, to enhance workforce capacity through supporting domestic violence and sexual assault programs, and program advocates in particular. Fringe benefits are allowable, provided that the benefits are reasonable and are required by law, non-federal entity employee agreement, or an established policy of the non-federal entity. They include, but are not limited to, the cost of leave, that's including vacation, family-related sick or military leave, employee insurance, pensions, and unemployment benefits. Fringe benefits can also include appreciation or hazard pay and stipends, for example, following federal guidance with written board approved policies and your established cost allocation plan. Pass through entities and sub grantees should have policies that allow and explain bonuses, salary increases, and hazard pay. Um, for example, and provide explanation on how the amount of bonus, salary increases, hazard pay, and stipends were determined. And this is if you determine this is how you want to use your FIPSA ARP funds. Things to consider when determining these kinds of policies is to think about if staff are provided childcare stipends, what does this mean for staff who don't have children? Is everyone allowed a childcare stipend? Um, are staff required to use it for childcare specifically, or is it an automatic stipend to be used, um, you know, determined by the staff person? Should stipends be more generalized, such as a family care wellness stipend to pay for various, expense, various expenses, such as childcare, wellness plans, vacations, mental health, or other items as determined by the staff person? Look at raises and bonuses previously provided to staff. What percentage did you provide in the past? And what can you do now? And you can look at the cost of living percentage over the last three to five years and consult um, the cost of living um, adjustments. And we'll put the link for you um, in the chat, or you can find it at the US Social Security um, website to determine the cost of living adjustment percentage table to help inform your policy. Subrecipients can allocate bonuses, hazard pay, and salary increases, but they still must allocate it across the various funding sources. 
So in order to do this, they, they need to look at the whole amount of the salary, including the bonuses, hazard pay, and salary increases, and then figure out the allocation of each funding stream in terms of percentage and hours per week worked. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Laura, who will help us wrap up this training session with information on training resources and grant management tools. Okay. Um, I wanted to make a note about all of the links that I have posted in the chat, and there will be many more links posted in the chat as we wrap this up. We promise we're gonna send all of these links to you. Um, um, in an email format um, as we follow up um, from the training. And as I've, we've posted, we will have all of these things on FIPS's website and make sure that you have access to the links. So we do not want to leave you empty handed after training today. This was a significant amount of information to process. We will share the recording of this training in English and in Spanish um, in the next couple of weeks. And we encourage you to share it with colleagues who may not have been able to attend the training session today. We have several documents that we will share in the chat that will be helpful for you as you manage your funds. We will also send the links um, to these documents in our post-training communication. Um, so if you would all just give me a, um, a second, I'm gonna start to um, post a few of these items in the chat as we begin to wrap up. If you have questions, um, now would be a good time to ask some final questions in the Q&A as we post some um, links in the chat for you. So we have um, uh, some grants management resources around um, all of the FIPS ARP funding, so the guidance and the, um, the guidance memos. So we will post those. Um, and then we're gonna also post um, uh, some post-award reporting forms and some other information, including the FIPSA 2016 rule. These are big documents, so let me get these into the chat. While Laura's posting those yeah. um, links yeah, in the chat, Jeanette. I can talk a little bit about the um, resources for drawing down FIPSA funds. Mm -hmm. You will hear us talk a lot about the importance of obligating and drawing down your funds throughout the training series. You are doing such important work and you know firsthand how important this funding is to survivors and the organizations you serve. Your FPO and grants management officer are here to support you in navigating any barriers that prevent you from drawing down your funds in a timely manner. But drawing down your funds is really critical um, to ensuring that um, we can see on our end um, that the funds are being utilized and allocated and that we can support you in um, fully utilizing these critical um, resources. The payment management system or PMS offers a range of training and resources to help you with um, um, processing your drawing down the funds and submitting your federal financial report. I'm also going to just share with you all the um, upcoming trainings. A lot of um, uh, topics we touched on today, we will provide um, more details um, in upcoming trainings. At the end of May, on May 24th, um, we will be providing our second training on the roles and responsibilities for pass-through entities. We will be covering um, understanding the financial and performance monitoring requirements and the standards and best practices for financial management and managing multiple grant um, streams and identifying strategies for pass-through entities that they can utilize to build the capacity of subgrantees and to describe the expectations for drawing down FIPSA grant funds. You may hear a theme in all of these trainings around drawing down FIPSA grant funds in a timely man manner and how we can support you in doing that. The last training will be at the end of June, on June 29th or the third module. 
Here we'll talk about internal controls, which is something else you heard us mention many times when we discussed how important it is to have policies and procedures in place that will help you spend um, prudently your, um, your grant funds. In this training, we'll define the purpose and key elements of internal controls. Um, we'll talk about the role that management, program, and financial staff play in establishing and maintaining internal controls. We'll discuss how internal controls are used to achieve operations, reporting, and compliance objectives. And we'll identify resources to help administering agencies and subgrantees to design, design, implement, and operate effective internal controls. Now I'll pass it over to Laura to wrap up the training. Okay, thanks, Suzanne. Um, I've been posting a few things in the chat. Folks are asking great questions. Um, we're gonna send all of this information out. Everything will be available on the website. Registration for the May training will launch in the next few weeks. Um, and we will do the exact same thing with modules two and three. We will have those available on the FIPSA website as well. Um, so please take note of your FIPSA program officers and see that you have um, a separate FPO for your um, American Rescue Plan sexual assault grant. They are here to support you and I encourage you to reach out and build a relationship with them if you haven't already. Relationships are essential for FPOs to understanding your successes and challenges and for grantees, it is more stressful to relate, to relate a crisis or immediate concern to a stranger than to share it with someone with whom you have an established relationship with. So you can see we've got um, all the regions listed here and um, who your contact is, whether it's your FPO, um, and also you will have a separate uh, FPO for the ARP Sexual Assault Award. You can see their name and information, and we will absolutely send this to you. Um, thank you so much for participating in this training. Um, we're committed to providing you with a meaningful and, res and responsive support. To that end, please fill out this post-training survey. So we're gonna pop this um, into the chat right now um, uh, to let us know if this training was helpful and what additional information and support that you would like. Um, we'd like to thank uh, Director Shondell Dawson with FIPSA and the FIPSA program officers for all of their help in developing this training and Director Janice Caldwell with the Office of Grants Management and the OGM staff for their expertise and support as well. And I know that they were answering as many questions as they could in the Q&A. So big, big thank you and shout out to OGM. I'm going to pop the survey here one more time, um, which is our post survey. We really appreciate you taking the time to fill out the pre and post survey. It gives us a sense of where we can create new tools and provide additional training and technical assistance. We also engage subject matter experts for their insights in the development of this training, including Donna Phillips with the Iowa Office of the, of the Attorney General and Jackie Old Coyote and Tor Parker for their tribal grantee perspective. I also wanna thank the Spanish and ACF interpreters for making our web webinar accessible today and to our very capable tech support staff. We're so appreciative. I'm popping the form. Like, in case you didn't know, we really wanted you to fill out the survey. I'm going to pop it in one more time. All right. And on a final note, um, as Suzanne and I, who are former advocates, um, totally um, understand what it's like to go through um, administering grants. We know that you are not alone. Um, we want to leave you with an, ins um, with an insight that our subject matter expert, Jackie Old Coyote, shared with us. You may feel like you are alone in a raging river of activity. This session is intended to give you the tools needed to navigate your grant or a metaphorical river. Also, we want to remind you that we are all a part of a larger system. Like a river, there is a source, pictured on the right, in our case, the government grant. And from that, there is an interconnected system that you are all a part of. Just as with water systems, the course of flow may change, but the important thing is to remember we are part of a system that is in interdependent with each other. We are in this exciting and important work together and we thank you so much for your time today.